All right, guys, we're here with Rahul. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I'm excited about this conversation because uh, you guys have a working product, uh, which is somewhat rare. Uh, and you're one of the first founders um, with an actual token that we've had on the podcast. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. For sure. All right. Uh, how about just a quick background uh, on you personally, right? How do you get to uh, to crypto and esports? Sure. Um, well, I've been a longtime um, entrepreneur in the video game space. I actually started... Um, the, the world's first PC gaming hardware manufacturer. We used to build PCs specific to play video games on. And uh, <clears throat> I ended up selling it to HP um, many le- years later. And um, so I've been in the gaming space for a long time. I got involved with a lot of startups. I'm uh, you know, on the board of advisor and early shareholder in Razer. Um, I've been you know, involved in like VR and AR companies and things like that. And I, I ended up joining Microsoft um, after selling to HP. And I, I was at Microsoft for a few years, started Microsoft Ventures, um, and we would invest in companies and we set up startup accelerators around the world. And at that time, I was really looking at the esports space uh, very closely. And uh, one of the companies that we invested in at Microsoft was a, a, a video game community company. Um, myself and the CEO got along really well. And I decided that uh, in 2014, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving Microsoft to start Unicorn with him. So that's what we did. Awesome. Yeah. Let's talk about esports in general, because I think uh, it's very, very underrated uh, outside of maybe the tech community and specifically the esports thing. Um, like, how big is this, right? Sure. So esports is, is actually the, the, the fastest growing sport right now. It's, <laughs> it's huge. There's, there's literally uh, hundreds of millions of fans around the world that, that watch people play professional, like professionals play video games effectively. So it's, it's like watching the NFL, but you're, you're actually watching people play like League of Legends or Dota mm-hmm. or something like that. And it is, um, it is, it's, it's massive. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's popular all around the world. Um, you know, we, we have, uh, I have some videos, like we actually have a team that we assembled. Um, they're the most popular esports team in Germany. They're also one of the best CSGO teams in the world. They're called BIG. And um, there was an event that, uh, that they did recently. Um, there was a, you know, a huge stadium in, in Germany that was sold out. There was like 20,000 people in the arena. It looked like a World Cup event. And if we had 20,000 jerseys with the name on it, they would have bought them. Like, it was that nuts. That's awesome. Um, so, yeah, it, it is a very, very big uh, space. And, um, and not only does it involve watching games, but it also involves people who, who watch players. Um, there's a huge, you know, there's, there's a lot of fan and community building in the space. And there's also the competitive side of actually playing video games competitively against people as well, um, yourself. So... Yeah, got it. And, and when we talk about this, right, what is the draw of watching people play video games? Is it just that so many people play the games and then they get to watch people who are better than them, or, or, or like what is actually um, you know uh, inspiring people to, to spend the time to watch other people play the video game? So, it's a great question. It's, it's it's like you know if you're a huge fan of um, let's say you're a fan of the NFL, right, mm-hmm. and you and you love to watch the Seahawks play, for example. Um, um, and, and like imagine, you know, you can watch the game and you can be excited about Russell Wilson throwing a, you know, a touchdown or whatever, that sort of thing. But imagine then being able to watch Russell Wilson practice in his backyard for six hours while talking to you on the camera. Right. Mm-hmm. That level of engagement you get in esports, you just don't get in any other sport. These these guys will go home, they'll stream and uh, and they'll stream themselves playing games that are highly complex highly detailed that you know the the amount of betting markets that we can create in one esport match is is much higher than you can do on a traditional sport Mm -hmm. so so there's a lot of like thinking that goes into it and then watching these guys play they're super entertaining some of them are are just amazing like i i watch this i watch one streamer almost daily his name is bunny fufu i watch him for about an hour wait what's what's the name bunny fufu oh amazing (laughs) he's a he's a league of legends player but he's he's super funny and and you know just if you know the game and how complex it actually is just watching him play it's it's kind of masterful it's really neat um and and so you watch them for a while and then you want to see if you can do that so you can just load up the game and start playing it yourself that's sort of the allure and it's um it's it's a space where you know literally hundreds of millions of people do this This is why twitch is so popular right it's why youtube gaming exists it's why 
every major publisher aspires now to have you know a true esport title because the amount of revenue that they can generate from just the events the viewership the play the skins all of that stuff is just a it's it's incredible um you know how 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 big these companies are getting absolutely and, and so let's talk about these esport uh teams right because i think it, um w- watching somebody at home you know, while they're playing and they're streaming live is one thing because you get kind of that practice element. But then a lot of these players end up going and joining a professional team. Walk us through, like, wh- do they all live together? Do they train together? Is there, like, practice sessions and then games? Where are the games held? Like, just what does that professional esports uh, community look like? Yeah, so uh, there, there's there's a few really popular uh, esports out there. There's League okay. of Legends, there's Dota 2, there's CSGO. Um, those are sort of the big ones. Fortnite is pretty popular, but in terms of the team games, it's the first three that I mentioned. And you know, it, it's 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 very interesting because you'll have you'll have these players go into a team house. They stay in a team house. There's coaches. There's um, there's you know uh, like therapists. They have they have people that actually work with them on you know physical activity uh they work with them on psychology like mm-hmm. there's a sports psychologist on the team there's there's you know a couple of different types of coaches on the team and they they literally play games all day long and they train all day long mm-hmm. to, to be the best at, at what they do and that's those typical esport games and then now you've got the nba for example coming into esports and they're really investing heavily into it because they they notice a big trend like in in traditional sports if you just look at traditional sports as a whole, start with, say, the, the PGA Tour. Mm-hmm. The average PGA Tour fan is 79 years old, mm-hmm. right? The average uh, Major League Baseball fan is 57 years old. Wow. Right? These guys are getting older, and every day, you know, a Major League Baseball fan and a PGA Tour fan, you know, passes away. And there's like four esports fans born because people start playing video games at a much younger age than what they used to play, right? Mm-hmm. And so the NBA is looking at this and thinking, okay, we want to get younger people into the arena. And we want to capture their attention. So they actually started creating eSport teams, uh, and they had a full combine. Um, and they, they have houses. They have training facilities. I mean, these are like world-class setups. This is the NBA 2K League you're talking it's about. the NBA 2K League I'm talking about. Yeah. So, so I actually know somebody who was coaching one of these teams, and it was fascinating to hear him talk about um, not only what goes into it in terms of uh, playing, but these things you're talking about, right? The the practice sessions, uh, the drafting of players. Um, you know, this is very analogous to the way that non esport games work, right? Or teams. So yeah. Just like the NFL or NBA has these these combines, drafts, etc. How is this evolving, right? Because really, my understanding is that most of this originally was occurring internationally and now is becoming popular in the U.S. Like it's almost gone reverse for most people in the U.S. that it was popular somewhere else and now here. Actually, Anthony, I, I, you know, n- not to correct you, but... but no, no, yeah, if you disagree, it's, it's, I want to hear no, you disagree. Like, I, I'll disagree in the sense that it was discovered here because okay. people weren't paying attention to it, right? Like, I, I don't know if it's a cultural thing. Maybe people just don't pay attention to what their kids are doing as much here as they do, say, in, in South Korea. Mm-hmm. Um, but... But it's really popular here, and it's always been quite popular here. Um, it's just not; it hasn't been as public here because typically people here they'll they'll look at things like if something needs to be mainstream, it has to be on TV, for example, mm-hmm. right? That's the old way of looking at things. Mm-hmm. You know, the reality is esports doesn't need to be on TV. TV needs esports on TV if if cable cutting is to stop, right? But we all know cable cutting is happening, and it you know Twitch is where where people are sort of gathering. Um, YouTube is where they're gathering. YouTube TV is, exists for a reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and these trends are happening as, you know, sort of as we speak. So, you know, when I was at Microsoft, yeah, you know, I was doing a, a lot of interesting things with different startups and we were doing trend spotting. One of the things we, we learned was that there was hundreds of millions of people that were watching other people play video games, which mm-hmm. is really kind of strange when you think about it. If you're, if you're somebody from the outside looking in, you're like, whoa, what, what is this? And most of these people were playing on the Microsoft platform. They were playing on Windows or Xbox, right? But mostly Windows. Mm-hmm. So, so imagine there's like two people at Microsoft that know what's going on, and everybody else has no clue that all these people are actually watching these games, right? And my son was the one who really got me into uh, these games. He, he said, like, Dad, you know, you, you started Voodoo many years ago. You got to quit Microsoft and go back into gaming and really look at what happened to esports. Because when I was doing it, it was just competitive gaming. It wasn't as popular. Mm-hmm. And um, I started to spend time in his world. And I think it's really just spending time with your kids and seeing, you know, where the trends are actually going. For sure. Well, let me ask this question. How do you think 
the cord cutting and the kind of the streaming, et cetera, will impact um, kind of in-person attendance. And the reason why I ask this is I remember there was this photo that kind of went semi-viral. Uh, it's the Staples Center. And right? everyone's on their phone? And, and Well, at one, everyone's on their phone, and they have the big screens up. And, you know, when you go to, like, an NBA game, for example, there's a court and there's kind of movement and people are running around and everything. But everyone went to the Staples Center, and it it appeared – I've never been, right? So, so this is all kind of my understanding of it. Uh, the players were down in the in the center of the arena, and they were playing, and they were kind of lined up, you know, each team on each side. But most of the fans were not watching the players. They were actually staring at the screen of the game of which the players were playing. So they went in person to the Staples Center. I mean, there were tens of thousands of people there, and they're all watching a screen. Is One, is that accurate? And then two is – do you think that the streaming live, right? I can almost get that same experience at home. Will that take away from those imperfect in-person experiences? No, you see the difference between, and this is what's fascinating about esports is these are these are not like three-hour events. These are multi-day events. You know, the the last international, the Dota Two International, had a twenty-four million dollar prize pool, mm-hmm. and it was a multi-day event. So people would pay three hundred dollars for a weekend ticket, and they might pay a couple hundred dollars for a weekday ticket. Um, so they go there for multiple days, and what's a, what's amazing about esports is, I promise you, you walk into an esports arena and you watch, uh, those people are fixated on the action in the game, which means you actually have to watch the screens. Mm-hmm. But they're watching the players, and they're not on their devices at all, like they're mm-hmm. because there's just so much going on in the game that they just want to focus on what's happening mm-hmm. in the game. So, you know, it, it's it sort of goes back to um, one of the hypotheses with with the NBA was that young people don't have the attention span to spend three hours inside the arena. So what are we going to do to attract young people? And they're mm-hmm. wrong. Um, you know, these guys will spend nine hours watching esports, you know, like full on because they actually care about it. And, mm-hmm. the, and there's just a lot of detail happening in the in the game. So um, so so go, going back to, you know, the idea of a second screen experience, um, Unicorn, we actually created a. a we, we have a lot of people in, in the betting business who don't understand esports, right? So, okay, before you go into yeah. this, let, let's talk about Unicorn specifically and what you guys are doing oh, sure. and then we can get into. Um, so, so give us some background on Unicorn and, and kind of what you guys are doing and, and then we can talk about the product and, sure. and what you're doing. Sure, so, so we're, uh, Unicorn is um, effectively the, an esports bookmaker, okay. but, we're, but we're much bigger than that. Um, you know, a, a typical betting company is just a, is, you know, they'll have odds and they'll put odds up and people will bet, you know, against yep. lines and things like that. Unicorn is a fan first betting company. We were founded in 2014. We're venture backed. Um, you know, we, we had investment from Ashton Kutcher, Mark Cuban, Elizabeth Murdoch, Sherry Redstone, like a bunch of really great investors came into to, to Unicorn when we first started. And um, we're, we are uh, sitting at the intersection of um, esports and video games, um, regulated gambling and blockchain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, and it's 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 a really neat space because you know we're we're building the most comprehensive sports book for esports in the world where you can bet on lines, but we also have a skill betting product. The the neat thing about esports is you can have you can monetize it in many different ways, but it's truly a skill. Like if you play League of Legends, right? You're it's your skill that you're playing, right? And we've come up with a, a way for us to put odds on your chances of winning a game. How do you do that? That's so, fascinating. Yeah, so in 2015, we created a coin called the Unicoin. And um, we did it because we wanted to test out new betting markets. Um, we weren't licensed in every market around the world, obviously. We, we only had a couple of licenses because one of our investors is the largest uh, betting company in Australia. And they, they let us get a license in Australia and the Isle of Man that we could work with them just to, just to test the efficacy of our sports book. Mm-hmm. But there's people in the US, there's people in Korea, there's people like all over the place that wanted to use the platform. So we created the Unicoin as a free token that people could earn and they could use it on the platform. It couldn't be bought or sold, mm-hmm. um, but it could be used for jackpots, for skins, and you know other things. Sort just of like, like digital points, just like or digital points. Else, yep. But but um, w- you know we, we created it to sort of test out new betting products and things like that. And at the same time, what happens is customers come to our platform. They connect their League of Legends account, or they connect their their Dota or their CS:GO or Rocket League. They, you can connect your ro- you know your 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 gaming account to our platform, mm-hmm. even Fortnite, and you earn tokens as you play and win games, right? Okay. And then, um, and you earn these tokens and you can use them for different things on the platform. But what we do then is once you're connected, we can start collecting data on gameplay, you know, game dynamics and things like that. And we start building, we started to really um, hone our odds, be- our odds uh, making skills, right? And so, so, so not only do we create amazing odds on just all this, the professional matches out there, mm-hmm. we now can create odds on individuals matches. And the reason we did that 
was because we know that if people want to bet on themselves, they don't want to wait for someone else to bet against. Like, mm -hmm. if, if I want to bet, you know, on League of Legends, I don't want to wait for you to, to play against me because then it's like I'm waiting there and, you know, who knows if you're going to bet or not, right? I want to do it so I can just bet on myself. And that's what we did. So, so we made it possible for people to bet on themselves in the game and then play the game. And, then it, and we put odds on their chances of doing certain things. Like for me, if I play Fortnite, I have a 15 to 1, you know, <laughs> odds of being 1 in 100, right? Mm -hmm. So I could bet 100 bucks and, you know, win $1,500 essentially on, on a game like that. And that's, that's how we do it. Um, and, then, and then so, so as I said, Unicorn does skill betting and spectator betting. We, we are a community first company. So like I'm a big believer that, you know, if you want to build a, a real brand, you have to have a community, you have to have a fan base. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about Apple, I think about Ferrari, you know, Tesla. These are, these are companies that actually have fans that evangelize and love their product. Mm -hmm. So we create content um, you know, like ESPN would around esports. We also have a team. So as I mentioned, I mentioned BIG. We have a tournament platform where people can create their own tournaments. We run events at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas every week. Um, we, uh, you know, and then, and then we have these, these, you know, these cool betting products that we've created. And the one thing I was going to mention to you about that, you know, the spectator thing is we created a bingo game where you could be watching a match and it auto populates with all the live data in the game. Like if you're watching CSGO, for example, it'll be like, you know, bomb planted or, or first kill or, you know, that sort oh, of thing cool. on the bingo card. Right. And, and it, and it populates live. So it's sort of a, an, an um, onboarding for people who don't understand esports how to play it. It, it. You know, one of the things I've always uh, caught my attention about esports. I was in Nigeria of all places. Um, this may be two years ago now, and uh, they have these betting houses, right? So uh, basically, people in the local community will go into this, you know, building, and they will make bets. They'll bring cash, and they'll you know pick they'll a bet line on or whatever, right? And they'll, and they'll bet on um, these different soccer games or whatever it is, but. When my friend and I went in, we were trying to, you know, understand the community and the culture and all stuff. And so uh, the uh, the gentleman who was taking us around took us in and was explaining all this to us. And I saw a game playing on uh, on the television, but it wasn't humans. It was it looked like a video game. And I looked around and I didn't see anyone playing the game, but it w it was obviously playing. And so I, I asked the guy, so you know, what's going on there? He goes, Oh, those are the simulated games. And so what do you mean the simulated games? He goes, Well. What can happen is if there's no live games being played anywhere in the world and you don't want to bet on any of the upcoming games, actually 24 hours a day, I think it was, uh, there's these simulated games that play on the screen and you can actually bet on who's going to win the simulated game. You're not in control, right? right? So you don't have the ability to play. You don't know who is playing. Right? There's no human on the other side. It's literally a simulated video game, uh, but people are making bets on it. And so I asked him, you know, how popular is that? And he goes, it might even be more popular than some of the games. It's very right? popular. And, and so it, it was shocking to me how uh, that was a version of esports, to, you know, to a degree, but there wasn't even anyone playing. Yeah. Imagine. Um, so as I mentioned, Tab Corp is one of our investors, mm -hmm. right? And they're the largest. They're a $14 billion uh, wagering company based in Australia. They, they have these, these terminals where you can walk up. Horse, horse betting is huge in Australia. But they have these terminals where you can walk up and you watch like digital horses race. Mm -hmm. It's like 24 hour betting. We're applying that thinking to esports, and um, we're releasing a product in the next three months that will allow people to, to you know, to do something similar. I'm mm -hmm. not, I can't get into too much detail, yep. but basically, the idea is that right now there, we, we cover a lot of different matches. Like there's thousands of markets that you can bet on on our product, but. Um, but the more markets you have, the more products you have, the, the, the more likely people are to bet in, in different regions and For things sure. like that. And given our expansion that we're, we're in the middle of, um, that's really important to us. So that type of betting, that 24-hour betting is really, really key. And, um, and as you said, what you saw was like a version of esports, but not really. But imagine if it were games that people were familiar with that you could bet on. Uh, absolutely. Why is like Madden, right? So the, the NFL version of a uh, video game, why is that not as popular in the esports world as like, let's say the League of Legends or uh, Fortnite or, or one of those? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. So that's like a that's like a sort of a, um, a mainstream way of looking at it, right? You mm -hmm. think about, you know, like Madden, NBA 2K, you know, how do these things become more, you know, um, I, I ask because I, I, my brothers and I spent our entire childhood yeah, arguing over right? who was good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so l l let me just explain the 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 ecosystem really quickly. Um, the games like Dota and League of Legends, like you know CS:GO, high functioning players um, 
are tend to be um, great collaborators. They tend to be they tend to work well under pressure. They tend to be really fucking smart, like really good at math. Mm -hmm. um, they they also um, they they also can you know can can make you know great like quick decisions and be mm -hmm. really good leaders. This is why many universities are actually offering scholarships now. And in fact, this year you'll see Ivy League universities offering scholarships for top players because they want those type of students in their schools. They, these, are, these are the best students that you could possibly get who play League of Legends or Dota at the highest levels. I mean, it, it is a very difficult game to play. And I promise you, anybody who plays at a high ELO is super smart, right? Um, it, games like uh, like NBA and 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 you know Madden and things like that. Th these are sort of these were kind of one player games, right? They were kind of one player competitive games mm -hmm. where you play against you know each other. The, the 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 leagues are starting. So NBA 2K is a good start because they actually have team team play, and team play offers a different dynamic than like a single one on one play. Um, FIFA has uh, esports league now, and so but they're they they have like one or two players per team. So it's it's something that they're starting to build, and they're trying to turn it into you know something th that it's currently not, but it will it will eventually get there. It'll eventually be popular amongst a certain audience. Um, the thing is, though, I, I believe that the reason these other games are so much more popular is just because of the complexities and the you know all the variances that happen within the game itself. Interesting. Where do you think esports goes, right? So I, I've heard and I've, I've actually uh, tweeted this that esports will be more popular than the NFL at yeah. some point in the future, right? And and uh, and I think it's just law, law of large numbers, global audience, right? Kind of uh, trends, etc. But wh where do you think it goes um, in terms of in the United States? How does this evolve? Do we literally see, you know? the traditional sports giving way to esports and, and it's like a binary one has to lose and one has to win do they coexist does espn all of a sudden start covering esports right like how does this play out so espn is covering esports now right um the, the 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 question is like where does it go i think i think esports can coexist with traditional sports i think for example you could say unicorn right now is an esports only company okay. but in the future you could say that we're esports first um, and we'll start to look at other sports that are esports friendly, for example. But to me, if you really want me to paint the future of where esports is going, I'm I'm somebody who uh, I heavily invested in a um, in a uh, a VR AR company based in Canada called Vervana. They just got bought by Apple uh, recently. Um, but but what they were working on was really compelling. So 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 they had a headset that you'd wear like an Oculus, right? But the difference between this and the Oculus was this supported full VR, but it also had cameras on it, so you could do AR with it as well. Now, what was unique about it, and the reason Apple bought them, was um, you could be wearing it in this room, and I could throw a football at you across the room, and you'd catch the ball, right? Because the latency was just like near zero. Now, um, now um, there's these arenas that you can go into where you can play like laser tag for adults, basically. There's a, there's one in Seattle called Virtual Sports. You wear a vest, you walk around with a with a fake gun with articulating feedback. Um, there's sensors on your you know on your head on the vest, and then there's TVs everywhere with like data on what's happening in the game. Um, and you're running around, you're playing laser tag, and um, you know they, they have different games. They have capture the flag. Mm -hmm. You know it's team based. It's really fun. Now imagine that with 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 uh, AR. Like you're you're wearing AR goggles now, and now you're being dropped into a map. So now you're playing like real life Call of Duty against other players, and then there's people watching on the top that are placing bets on the action. That to me is sort of the future of esports, where you have a blend of physical and virtual worlds. What's the um, timeline for that to happen, you think? It's, it's sort of happening, like it's coming together now, but I would say within five years we'll start to, to, to see that in a, you know, in a bigger way. Really? Yeah. And do you think in that scenario uh, what's holding us back is like people's desire to do that? Do you think it's the technology, right? So actually like the AR goggles themselves, like why hasn't it happened already? The technology. Okay. The, the technology definitely has to be there. And, and also, you know, it's – it's it's like a, it's like a process, right? I mean, these things develop over time. They sort of they come out of nowhere. People mm -hmm. are like, where did this come from in the first place? Well, you know, when 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 people say like, how are, how is it that hundreds of millions of people are watching these games and I didn't know about it? Well, it's because you're in a different world. Like you're a different generation, right? You didn't know because you're you're too busy watching ESPN on TV mm -hmm. rather than looking at what your kids are watching on Twitch, right? Mm -hmm. And once you once you sort of immerse yourself in that world, you can start to see where things are going. Um, and I think that's just, you know, the reality is it's sort of happening today, but it's happening in, in ways that are maybe not as obvious to some people. Got it. Let's talk about the company and, and kind of this token that you guys have, right? Because I'm, I'm really fascinated by um, 
people who create tokens that have a working product and they use it as an incentive, right? right? So you, to either um, drive users, drive actions, you know, this isn't something that's new, right? We've been using streaks, badges, points, you know, kind of the whole nine yards as uh, digital assets or digital <laughs> products for, um, you know, incentivizing behavior for a long time. Right. What you did was you basically created a token that would allow somebody to wager, quote unquote, value, right? Although it wasn't accepted currency, it was a value on the uh, on the platform. When you first started, was it based on the blockchain? Was it not based on the blockchain? So when we first started, no, it was not based on the blockchain. Okay. What, what happened was um, we were in the middle of getting our license in Malta. And, and we knew that we were, we were just about to get our license in Malta for, for fiat betting, right? Mm -hmm. And I put a call out to investors because we needed to open up a couple of bank accounts in Europe. And I don't know, you know, if you've ever tried to open up a bank account in Europe, but it's a real nightmare, especially being in a highly regulated business like mm -hmm. ours. So I put a call out to our investors and I said, hey, we need to open up some banks in Europe. Can you in introduce us? And within two minutes, I got an email from Mark Cuban who said, are you guys looking at blockchain? And this was like in late 2015. Um, and I said, no, not really, not yet. And he said, well, you really should. Um, you know, it's the future of commerce. There's a lot of reasons why you as a regulated business would want to, you know, be on blockchain. You should start looking into it. And, and so we did. Um, and, and, you know, at the time, we already had the Unicoin going. We had turned over a quarter billion Unicoins in six months. And, you know, we're looking at blockchain from the standpoint of, as a regulated business, how can blockchain technology help us, right? Mm -hmm. Now, imagine we're dealing with regulators on a regular basis. They, they care about things like AML and KYC. Um, you know, they care about responsible gambling where, where uh, customers can have like a full history of their, their bet history. You know, you put, imagine putting it on a ledger, you know, that, that can't be modified. Um, and then on top of that, we have this, this coin economy that's going. But, but even before the coin economy, we're thinking about how we could use blockchain to really help our business. But more than anything, how can we use it to, to disrupt banking, to circumvent banks? Like, uh, not about breaking the laws. It's more about circumventing banks, which is like an old archaic system that, that you know, in, in reality, in our business, it's, it's shitty. Like, it, mm -hmm. it, if you build a really good blockchain platform, um, there is no better way to track AML and KYC than through blockchain uh, on any fiat betting platform. Mm -hmm. and, and so we were convinced. You know, we were building. Um, we, you know, at, at, and at the same time, we started to poll our customers about the Unicoin. And we said, hey, you know, like, um, we didn't, outwardly say, should we turn this into cryptocurrency? Mm -hmm. we, we started to ask some questions like, are you familiar with Ethereum? Are you familiar with Bitcoin? You know, have you ever traded like on a, a wallet and this sort of thing? And what, we were, what was crazy was 70% of our customers responded favorably and said they'd either trading or they were interested in it, you know, like because they tend to skew younger, right? Yep. So we knew then, look, we have a user base already. We know that we can go do this. That's when we created Unicoin Gold. And, and Unicoin Gold works just like Unicoin Silver does, except you can take it off on an exchange. However, there's a, there's a few things that, that's really unique about it. So, so customers can still connect their League of Legends account or their Dota account, and they can earn these coins. They earn both gold and silver coins. But you can't just take the gold coins and then put them on Bitrix and dump them, right? You actually have to turn them over on the platform. So you can use them in jackpots for skins. Um, you can trade skins for coins. So, so not only can you use them in jackpots for skins, but these skins have real world value, right? Mm -hmm. People come to our platform all the time and trade all their skins for Unicoins. And then you can also, you, you know, the future when at the time was you could also bet with them. But we treat our coins like fiat, right? So, so we treat it like, you know, we need a license for this. Um, and, uh, and so at the beginning when we launched the coin, it was basically trading skins for coins, uh, entering jackpots, um, you know, doing things that were like non-wagering related. Mm -hmm. And uh, and our plan was to, to make it so that you could bet with the coins on skill and also spectator games. So we started to work on a license. And it took us about a year. We, we worked with the Isle of Man and with uh, Malta. And, um, and the Isle of Man, you know, they did a forensic audit on our token sale. They looked at how we handled KYC on the sale itself, how we handled forensic wallet, you know, forensic auditing on the wallets themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, and we eventually got a license, man. We got, we got, this is why I've been sort of bugging you. I just wanted to tell you that, look, you know, we're a company that's sitting in Seattle. We, 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 have, you know, we have a team that's sort of all over the world. We have 93 people in this company. And we just got a license. We're the only, put, put aside any type of esports or whatever, we're the only gambling company in the world with a license from the Isle of Man for live betting on sports, esports, online casino, and skill, right, with fiat and cryptocurrency. 
they, they've never given a license for anyone with cryptocurrency before, and they did it with us because they saw how we built our platform, and, and now we have a license. That's so, awesome. So, so now we're doing this rollout over, you know, across 20 countries. It's sort of a, I'd call it a slow rollout because mm -hmm. we just want to make sure that everything is working, mm -hmm. um, and including the U.S. We're, we're actually doing a, uh, you know, a, a launch in the U.S., imminently like mm -hmm. uh you know it'll be it'll we'll, we'll announce it within the next two weeks um and uh and it's going to launch across 41 states we're launching a certain product across 41 states it's legal in 41 states and and you'll be able to use unicoin gold as a, as a betting product in these states that's awesome congratulations yeah. thanks the, the it, what you're talking about here reminds me that um, I, I saw an article uh recently that said uh for the first time um i think it was teenagers or, or young people uh for Christmas, it was like a like you know here's what people are asking for Christmas and uh, both Bitcoin and uh, Fortnite V Bucks yeah were uh, were on the list yeah. and it was you know the article was basically saying look this is one of the first times that this has happened and it's becoming obvious that young people want more and more of these digital assets right whether yeah they don't care about cash or they they don't whatever. want cash <laughs> yeah yeah that's right and and, and uh, you know I'm guessing that that's going to continue right I, I don't see a reason why it would not. Um, and, and so how do you, you know, incorporate that into the growth plan, right? So, so I'm fascinated by this idea of if you've got a user base that will only continue to grow and, and the demand will continue to grow because more people will become aware of it, people will get older, it'll be replaced by even younger people who are still interested in this. How do you leverage that interest to actually um, kind of put, you know, rocket fuel on growth for a company that's in a space that, uh, you know, maybe couldn't have existed 10 years ago, but now today from technology, regulation, right, kind of consumer interest, um, it's all kind of coming to a head at the right time. Well, there's a couple of things. So so the first thing I would say is the, the beauty of the coin or the beauty of having a coin or a token is, um, you know, we're, we're building a brand around it. You know, the idea of Unicoin is, is, is no accident, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're using it as a foundation for building community. Um, and it's also a great way to discover new potential applications for our product. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, there's a, there's a high-end PC company based in New Jersey. They're like, they, they make the best PCs in the world. They're like desktop Ferraris. They're called Main Gear PC. Mm -hmm. um, they, they accept Unicoin a, a, to, to, uh, to purchase their gaming PCs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, they, they also started to uh, build these really cool mining machines that, you know, that, that are just... I would describe it as like the Bugatti of a mining machine. It's just like a beautiful looking system. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and they, you know, they're, they're creating applications around cryptocurrency uh, using, using our coin, but also just, you know, kind of thinking about crypto in general as a, as, as sort of a different use cases. And so it's like a neat way for us to discover interesting use cases. Um, there's other betting products out there, uh, other companies that are approaching us who, who want to build on blockchain mm -hmm. and don't know how, so they want to license some of our technologies. Um, and it's just it's just a, a really great way for us to discover what's coming in the future. And then from a standpoint of virtual goods, uh, there, there's really the, the gaming industry is crazy. I mean, the skin industry, I don't know how much you know about it, but l let me just give you a little bit of insight as to how big this industry actually got until at one point. There was uh, there, there's skins in, in Steam in Valve, in, in a game called CSGO that are super popular, and they have a real-world value outside of the game. And the way people purchase these skins is they buy keys for chests. A key is $2.50, and the chest, you open up a chest and you'll get a skin. Now, some of these skins are super rare, and they trade on a secondary market because Valve created an API that allowed people to trade these skins. Some of these skins, man, they sell for $5,000. Um, you know, there was a skin that, that sold at auction for 60 grand last year. Wow. It's, it's, it's stupid, right? And these are skins that just basically modify the look of your character in the game or your weapon in the game. And a couple of years ago, they, there were sites out there like across Eastern Europe and different places that allowed people to connect their Steam account to their platform. It takes about 10 seconds and then play games like Dice and Roulette. And these are all rigged games. This became the underpinning of the largest underage gambling ring in the history of gambling. There was over two billion dollars turned over in in in, in illegal gambling uh, with skin betting, and um, and it was horrible. I mean, thirteen year old kids were, were getting blown up, you know, betting mm -hmm. on games that they didn't even know what they were doing, but they were losing all their skins. And eventually, Valve, you know, uh, got got some major heat for it because effectively their API was enabling this, even though they weren't behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, they knew that it was kind of happening, and they started to send out cease and desist to all these different sites. 
Um, I guess I guess what I'm saying is that there's that sort of opened up the opportunity that there is a there is a market for for betting in the space, but it needs to be regulated. It needs to be you know 18 or over and, and that kind of thing. And then and then sorry, the second part I want to say about this is um, esports betting has opened our has opened the eyes of casino operators. How often do you go to Vegas? Do you go much or? Uh, I've been okay. So look, I go to Vegas all the time, and uh, if you walk through the through the slot machine area, which is the, the highest sort of revenue generator for the Las Vegas casino, you'll see more wheelchairs and walkers per square foot than anywhere else in the casino, right? There's basically 100, 150 year olds using these machines. And, and they tried everything. Like they're trying to, to, to make these machines more fun for younger people. So they retheme it with Britney Spears and they put music on it and they have Pitbull and all this stuff and they make it like almost like a dance club, but there's still 100 year olds using these machines. Young people hate slot machines, right? So, so we started to push on the MGM and other casinos saying, look, we, you guys should just like move some of these slot machines out and like, let's set up an eSports lounge and see what we can do with it. And now we actually do that. We actually have an eSports like area inside of the MGM Grand where it's like a high-end card room where people can go in and play Fortnite on Fridays. And they can, you know, they can, they can sort of uh, do a buy-in tournament like a card, like a card game, right? Mm-hmm. But eventually we see it where people will be able to go up to a machine They'll be able to, to to bet on themselves in that machine, and then you know the 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 uh, the cage just sort of pays them out. We also um, worked with them on bringing cryptocurrency onto the strip, so it was interesting. We worked with the Nevada Gaming Commission, and we said, look, we we just want to use Unicorn Gold as a means of incentive and prizing in these tournaments, mm-hmm. and uh, we actually got approval for it last year to do it. We're the first. You know, comp- first and last, I think, company to to be able to bring a, a cryptocurrency on the strip, um, and you know, we we did it in in MGM, you know, a few times. We ran it a few times, and then MGM sort of wants to kind of evaluate where this goes. But I think crypto in in a casino has a really really good place. Like I think it's, it's a natural fit with the whole chip economy and things like that. Being able to track these chips on the blockchain, you know, that sort of thing just seems like a natural fit. And I think all of these guys are really actively looking at the space. They just don't know how to get in yet. That's awesome. Yeah. W- what's the biggest uh challenge for all of this to uh to come together? Man, it, 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 just you, time? You, you, well, no, you know, you, you know, as I know, right, I've seen you on TV talking about this stuff and it, it's really just belief, you know, like mm-hmm. uh, it's so frustrating. Like Bitcoin, B- Bitcoin goes goes up hard and then it comes down hard. Right. And we've seen it do that multiple times and we know that it's going to go up again. And we know that the next bull market will be big, bigger than the last bull market, but maybe more focused. Right. Mm-hmm. Maybe there won't be 2000 coins. Maybe there'll be like 200. And that's a good thing. It's like a healthy kind of, you know, um, pruning. Yeah, yeah. Healthy pruning. And it has to happen. The frustrating part is when you're dealing with sort of mainstream investors or, you know, just like companies, like partners, things like that, and you're talking about it, using the word crypto is either you're going to get different reactions, right? It's either Mm -hmm. going to be really good um, or really bad. And, and, And imagine you're a company that's sitting at the intersection of regulated gambling. So we're already dealing in a highly regulated industry. Blockchain, which is not yet regulated but they're trying to regulate it they don't know how to regulate it mm-hmm. and then you know and then video games right so we're that's the challenge for us is we're, we're the good thing is we're comfortable dealing with regulators and we do it all the time the, the, the bad thing is there's there's still sort of uncertainty around how to regulate you know crypto mm-hmm. and how to regulate um, you know ICOs and things like that there was just too many scams last year and it just made it really hard for companies like us to, to sort of emerge right and and to kind of expose ourselves because if you look at it if you look at like coin market cap which i think should be completely changed right mm-hmm. like, but if you look at coin market cap and you and you say let's say the top 100 coins i, I hate to say this and i and it, you know this probably isn't a very popular opinion but like i would say 97 maybe 95 percent of all the coins in the in say the top 2000 or whatever the 2000 coins are going to disappear mm-hmm. and and five percent of them, or, or probably th- three to five percent, are going to be like stellar winners. But they're but they're buried underneath a pile of crap. And for us, uh, crypto is about being discovered, right? It's about um, like working with an exchange in in South Korea, for example, is about discovery for us, right? It's about you know somebody seeing our coin and saying, wow, what does this company actually do? And and you know versus say speculators who just want to buy and dump it and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. We we want users to discover us and actually use our platform. So there's a, th- those are some of the challenges, and then and then the other challenge is there's a ton of greed in the space, right? Um, we 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 believe uh, I believe exchanges are about discoverability. They're nothing to do with access. Access is a totally different animal. 
So imagine you are a customer of Unicorn, right? And you want to bet with Unicorn Gold. Yes, you can earn the coins on our platform, but let's say you want to bet like 100,000 Unicorns on something. You want to be able to acquire those coins. So in the past, you'd have to go to Coinbase, you'd have to buy some Bitcoin, you'd have to then take your Bitcoin, go over to say Bittrex, and then, and then deposit your Bitcoin onto Bittrex. And then from Bittrex, you'd have to convert that to UKG and then take it off to me. Like the, the, the experience is Hard. completely stupid, right? So we worked with Bittrex, which by the way, Bittrex I think is the best exchange uh, on the planet. They are, they are so good because they actually work with us on the platform itself mm -hmm. and and they helped us build uh, access to our token so we have a system where you can actually pay with credit card come to our website swipe a credit card buy your tokens right off the market and it comes right off of bitrex's market um, it doesn't work in the u.s yet but it works outside the u.s and around the world and that's about to me that's about access so the frustrating part for me is like many of these exchanges in the last year were charging massive listing fees uh, to tokens right and, you know, as you know, many of these tokens don't even have a product yet, yet they're paying like hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars for listing fees. And now, you know, with liquidity the way it is, they're coming back and saying, oh, by the way, you know, your liquidity isn't there. So therefore, we want to charge you market making fees. Here's mm -hmm. our fees for market making. And it's like, guys, you know, what you're doing is you're basically stripping out this ecosystem of any type of innovation at all by constantly charging for stupid shit versus helping them actually instead of thinking about exchanges and liquidity, you should be thinking about how do we turn our exchange into a platform and how do we help these companies actually build and innovate so that we have a long-term business here. And you know, the, fu the funny thing is as soon as we say no to that, uh, we got another notice from another large exchange saying, okay, well, we need, we need large deposits now <laughs> to protect our customers. Like, yeah, like, you know, and, and that's where I just say like, you know, GFS, like just, just, <laughs> just like, it's, it. so, it's just it. like, I'm, I'm just done with that, you know? And, um, and, and so that's why I think there just needs to be more sort of thought around if people talk about the ecosystem and they care, then they should actually put their money where their mouth is and start showing that they care and they want to help innovate. Skin so, in the game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, all right, before we wrap up, uh, I do quick uh, kind of rapid fire. Um, what's the most important company in crypto other than your own? Uh, I, 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 it sounds biased, but I'd say Bittrex. Bittrex. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, definitely. I don't think anyone's ever said that one before. Yeah, I'd say Bittrex because they work with regulators in the U.S. Mm -hmm. They're based in the U.S. Um, they are, though, I believe, one company, along with, say, Coinbase, that's, that's working to sort of legitimize crypto mm -hmm. and legitimize, you know, blockchain with, with huge implications. Mm -hmm. um, when you think about things like... Uh, you know, the, the, the future of the security token. Mm -hmm. And by the way, people look at, they think about security token, they think, oh, it's just about equity in a company and uh, on a token. It's not, it's way more than that. If, if you, uh, the idea of a blockchain security token can be, it could be profit sharing in a product. It could be short term loans. It could be long term. It could be based on real estate assets. It could be on a number of different things. And, you know, these guys are working actively to legitimize the idea of a security on a token and uh, and do it on an ATS, some sort of alternative trading system. So definitely Betrix, I think. Very cool. What What is the one regulation that you would change or improve if you had a magic wand and can just wave it? Um, well, I, I, I think I think I, I would say that um, it, it's not about regulation as as in I want clarity. So if, if I could change one thing, just give us clarity. You know, stop telling us to look at uh, laws from you know 100 years ago and trying to apply it to blockchain. Um, if you don't fully understand, you know what the, what the the products are actually being built. So mm -hmm. for us, regulatory certainty is more important than anything else. This is mm -hmm. why we're working in Malta um, because in Malta they're very crypto friendly. Mm -hmm. But but I promise you, even though they're crypto friendly, doesn't mean you can just go there and set up a scam. I work with regulators there, and they are hardcore. But the nice thing is you have regulatory certainty, so you can operate and innovate in that type of environment. I worry for the U.S. You know, to be honest, I worry that the language they use sometimes scares people, scares companies who who really are trying to build something, right? Who really want to build the next generation internet here in the U.S. Otherwise, we're going to lose like the the next Twitter, the next Facebook, the next Amazon, those types of companies. They're going to end up somewhere in like friggin' Malta, mm -hmm. which is really stupid, right? I mean, we we really need regulatory certainty to enable to to encourage innovation here yep. and like safe innovation, and not go out and like use language that scares you know, people into not wanting to do business here. For sure. Yeah. Uh, most important book you've ever read? Um, hmm. Um, I, I, I've read a lot of books. I, I think uh, a, a Brand New Deal, I, I really like that one. Why? It's, uh, 
it's 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 <laughs> it's probably a book that no one's read ever. It's it's made by a guy named Scott Bradbury who uh, basically talked about brand. Um, and I learned a lot about brand. Like I learned that a, a brand is more than just a logo you put on your T-shirt. A, a brand is effectively um, it starts with uh, with a first of all a great product. You have to have a killer product, uh, which is important. But second thing you have to have is you have to have a great team, a great culture. Now many companies would say, oh, that's that's basic stuff, right? Mm -hmm. The part that they miss is you need a fan base. Mm -hmm. If you create a fan base, then you have you know people that are going to carry you on your back when you're down and out, right? Mm -hmm. If you have those three components, the foundation of it becomes your brand. And I, I sort of gleaned that from that book. Yeah, very cool. Um, the only non-crypto question I ask, and then uh, you could ask me a question. Uh, we have to admit that aliens are real, and uh, every single time aliens are ever depicted, it's always as a human-like comparison, right? Yep. Uh, obviously, we have multiple types of species here on Earth. Uh, do you think that there are alien pets or alien animals, or are they all just alien humans? Uh, no, I, I think that there is... I definitely think there's alien animals. <laughs> I believe there's uh, life outside of Earth for sure, um, and uh, and I think it's all kinds of life. So yeah. Do you think that those aliens? I never asked anybody this before. Do you think those aliens uh, are likely to know about us? I think there's probably more advanced civilizations that know about us. Yes, absolutely. Interesting. All right. Um, I won't ask you why you think they haven't contacted us yet, or maybe you think that they have. Maybe they have. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we won't go down that rabbit yeah. hole. Um, what, uh, what one question do you have for me? I want to ask you about Tesla. Uh, oh, I, I, interesting. I, okay. I, I want you to tell me what you think the future of Tesla is in the next five years, and I'm going to tell you what I think. Um, the next five years. So I'm going to cheat, and I'm going to say that uh, – I'm going to remove the time frame. Sure. Right. So, just what do I think the future looks like for Tesla? Um, I don't have any kind of inside knowledge. I don't really know yep. anything other than what, what people externally have. But um, I will describe a world I believe can happen. Right. And, and I've gotten a lot of uh, heat about this, but I, I don't think ultimately Tesla is a car company. Right. I believe it's a power and energy company. Um, I believe that. Uh, what is happening uh, that, it, that a lot of people are not paying attention to is a complete disruption of the energy market and, and it's coming at it from a consumer standpoint. So we've had a ton of different renewable energies and you know all these different types of energy sources that are you know, supposed to be cleaner, better, you know all this stuff. What no one's ever been able to do is figure out how to get the consumer to demand those better types of energy, right? And so the best way to do that is actually not to sell them energy. It's to sell them a consumer experience that they want that's better. Yeah. And I'll make the comparison to the blockchain space. A lot of people would argue decentralization is better than centralization. But when you just go around and you say, I'm building, let's say, the decentralized Facebook Nobody is willing to leave the centralized Facebook for the decentralized Facebook just because it's decentralized. decentralized exactly. Right? You need to build a 10x better product or more to get them to switch, and you actually don't have to tell them that it's decentralized. You don't even have to tell them it's on blockchain. No, yeah. and, and, and if you build a better product, people will switch, right? And whether it's Facebook, you know, any, any product, I'm just using Facebook as an example, and then, oh, by the way, it happens to be decentralized. It's just an added benefit. Yes. Go back to the Tesla example. They've built a better car. Yep. Right. And so they get people to buy the better car. And oh, by the way, it just happens to be electric. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I think that that's the innovation and, and, and the beauty of what Musk has done here is he's convinced people to demand an energy source. Right. Without actually asking for just the energy source. Like I don't I don't I fundamentally do not believe that most people who are buying Teslas actually want Teslas because they are electric. I think they want Teslas because they believe they are better cars. Yeah. And yeah. that's really, really important. And so I think that will continue over time. And, and I think that he's going to hopefully do this 
cars, the charging network, right? The the home uh, wall unit, right? The the shingles, all of these different things that he can, uh, you know, kind of he's already showing. Um, if he can keep changing the consumer demand to demand the product because they think it's better, not just because it's you know got this energy source, I, th- I think that he can fundamentally change the way that we consume energy. I think it's an amazing. Uh, uh, it's it's I, I'm lighting up because you're saying something that I fundamentally believe that they're not awesome. a car company, right? And that they are. Uh, the, you know, I, I think there's an AI neural network part to it as well. You know, I, I don't know if you've driven one, uh, but I, 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 I drive, I'm a car nut, so I, I drive Teslas and I, I can tell you that, you know, the idea of autopilot and having other cars on the road is really interesting. I think Apple is going to buy Tesla. I think Apple, if Apple doesn't buy Tesla, they're in trouble. I think Google will buy them. Um, and, and I think Tesla would be better under Google than under Apple, but I think Apple's going to try very hard to buy Tesla. I think they'll make Elon Musk the CEO or the chief visionary. And then, you know, Tim Cook will do, you know, something around operations and, you know, operational CEO or something like that. Apple needs Tesla big time. They need that type of innovation back in the company. It's just, it's just not the same company as it used to be. It, it, it would be wild to see Tim Cook and Elon Musk cooperating a company together. Yeah. I don't know if that's good or bad. I'd have to think about it more, but yeah. that would be a that, that would be a very interesting world, and I wonder if they could coexist. Yeah, and you know the idea of Tesla at four twenty, you know, fund secure it is just to me it's cheap. I I just uh, I just can't, cannot believe what's happened to them in the last year with the SEC and all the other stuff that went down. But um, people underestimate Tesla. Uh, if they do, they're in trouble. So yeah. <laughs> Awesome, man. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. This is a yeah. lot of fun. I appreciate you you know, dropping so much knowledge about uh, eSports. It's a, it's a fascinating industry, and I think you guys are doing cool stuff there. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely.